So, and the idea is that some share of a population that is at a disadvantage migrates in response to the rural urban breakdown of population that is advantaged. So there's a kind of differential uh, in, in, in perception, at least in terms of uh, economic conditions in this case, but it's, it's broader than that. So the star curve is rural-urban divide, the more people will affect it and the more migration there will be. So that's the, the bottom line, right? And the model in spirit is compatible with the harris our approach, this notion that people migrate because of an expectation of improving their livelihoods. Um, the paper has uh, kind of a model that is developed based on a physical analogy. I'm not going to get into that uh, for this presentation, but it is essentially a model that has a certain level of structure and can be interpreted. Now, so the basics of the approach. So the basic premise of the approach is that there's a cutoff income level separating the poor from the non-poor uh, when it comes to the incentive to migrate. So if you are below the moderate poverty line, you're in that category that would like to be above the moderate poverty line. And so it depends the breakdown of rural, or rural urban population in these two categories. So. Uh, we will be operating with shares of the uh, national population that are above or below the poverty line, uh, both in rural and urban areas, uh, and dealing with net migration rates between uh, rural and urban areas. So the rest is best explained uh, graphically, so I'll try to walk you through uh, a little bit the, the thinking uh, behind this paper. Uh, so here we have on, on the x-axis the percent of urban population in the total population. On the y-axis, a percent of the rural population in the total population. And we start by mapping the share of people below the moderate poverty line. So this uh, is for a hypothetical country. Uh, you have that 15% uh, of the people are uh, urban poor and 50% are rural poor, right? So this diagonal line is the ISO poverty line. So essentially, if you migrate in the short term, you're just moving along this line. Meaning migrating per se does not change your income level. So the act of migration just moves you along this line. Uh, so if you're going from, from rural to urban, you'll be moving down that, that diagonal. Now we, we plot the uh, share of a population that is uh, uh, above that poverty level. And there too, I mean, the rural and urban breakdown. So this uh, schematic representation is one where uh, the higher income uh, population is mostly urban, not very rural, right? So you have that essentially in urban areas, income, uh, the, the, the likelihood of being poor in urban areas is lower uh, than that in rural areas uh, based on this breakdown. Now, this diagonal line is the total population line. So you're adding these two vectors, uh, and essentially you get uh, whatever combination you have over time, you end up on that diagonal when you add up these two vectors, right? So, uh, the, and, and this is the rural urban breakdown of the country. So the, in this case, you have that the country is 45% um, 45% uh, urban and 55% uh, rural, right? Now, the, the basic, uh, and here what we're trying to do is, does this work? Yes. Um, I'm not sure how well people can see uh, from, from the back, um, but the basic analogy that we're trying to make is that the more the, um, these two vectors are aligned, the lower the incentive to migrate. And so, for example, if, you're, if, if the situation is like this, where you have the same kind of uh, distribution among the poor between rural and urban, but among the better off, it's, it's more along that diagonal, the effect there is that essentially your likelihood of being, uh, if you're poor, moving to an urban area, the likelihood of being poor is exactly the same. Uh, it, you, know, it, you know, kind of abstracting from the fact that it depends on skills and a number of different things, but in a purely kind of uh, statistical manner, if you want, right? So this notion that if you move from a rural area to an urban area, you're going to improve your livelihood, the expectation is pretty low. Whereas in a situation like this, in fact, uh, the proportion 
of people that are poor in urban areas is lower. So what matters is this angle theta uh, and the size of you know, how many poor you have, how they're distributed between rural and urban areas, and uh, similarly in terms of those above the poverty line. So migration, as I mentioned, just moves you along uh, this diagonal. So it just changes the rural-urban uh, distribution of the poor. Uh, among the rich, uh, if nobody has migrated, uh, then that vector is unchanged. Now, what we see is that, for example, the angle theta, it's, it's kind of the effect of migration, if you think of it from an economic equilibrium perspective in terms of wages, it's narrowing that, that gap, and effectively it becomes less appealing to move uh, to urban areas as the more people you have uh, that are moving there but are, haven't yet shifted out of poverty. So you're increasing the number of urban poor. And uh, now, however, in the longer term, it's clearly more complicated than that, right? I mean, there are, there's dynamics uh, of development that make it more difficult to say exactly what's going to happen. So, for example, uh, in the longer term, you will have that uh, the uh, urban, uh, the the people who are above the poverty line in urban areas will in fact absorb the rural people who migrated. So you're moving off of that ISO poverty diagonal line here and, uh, and so you're changing the nature uh, of the incentives to migrate or not. So, um, and here also in the longer term you have another kind of complication which is there's a natural rate of urban increase linked to differentials in mortality rates between rural areas and urban areas. So you have to factor in, once you go into the empirical side, uh, you have to factor that in. But essentially, uh, you have a component that is due to natural migration, natural growth rates, uh, differentials between urban areas and rural, and rural areas, and then something that is uh, urbanization due to migration. Now, up on the top, in, uh, in summary, is what comes out of the model that you can estimate the migration rate as essentially the cross product of those two vectors. And uh, in terms of the, the magnitude of the, uh, of the size of a population that is below the poverty line, the magnitude of the size uh, of a population above the poverty line H, and then this angle that shows how much uh, they, they express a difference. The, the sign of the angle theta, basically that angle, if the angle is zero, then it means that the incentive to migrate is zero because your chances of exiting poverty are basically very low. Uh, if it's a big angle, then it says that really an urban condition gives you uh, that possibility to, um, to move out of poverty. So, uh, as I said, I mean, for this kind of big report that is meant to, uh, to try and be a little bit global, we needed uh, something where we had uh, data. And in fact, uh, for, uh, for this uh, below income in rural and urban areas and above the poverty line uh, in rural and urban areas, we have that data thanks to uh, IFA who kindly shared it last year for a report that we did. And then the angle between those two vectors is easy to calculate. So in fact, we can think of this measure as an incentive to migrate. And, and so, uh, and the parameter A, which you can then estimate, uh, it represents the propensity to migrate. So let's say a larger L, meaning a larger proportion of the population that is poor, means that they will try to improve their livelihoods potentially by migrating. Uh, a larger H implies a certain capacity to absorb uh, people coming in, uh, meaning that there is a, a, a breadth of wealth uh, so that you can try and exit poverty, uh, possibly by going to urban areas if that's, uh, if the distribution is in that direction. And as I mentioned, the theta and the sine of theta means unequal distributions of poor and non-poor between rural areas and urban areas. So at the core, I mean, this is a little bit, it's, it's a push-pull narrative without saying what's push and what's pull. It's kind of, it's all determined uh, endogenously. It's very basic, but it does capture this nuance of the differentials. So putting real data to the graphical approach. This is uh, data for China. Uh, up, up here is China in 1990. Um, 
And so, you know, large uh, part of the population was below the moderate poverty line of three dollars ten uh, a day, and uh, a lot of it was a uh, large number of that were uh, rural, seventy percent, fifteen percent were urban, and then you fast forward to two thousand eleven. Here at the bottom, uh, you know, period of exceptional development in China. Uh, you have a much smaller share of poor and um, still predominantly rural, right? And I think what's, uh, what's interesting is, in fact, the, this incentive to migrate that we calculate in terms of that angle and how it interacts hasn't changed that much. So you've had a lot of migration, but this, the incentive to migrate has not gone away, right? It hasn't balanced the, essentially what is the labor market. Now, looking at another example, and this, I mean, these graphs we can do for 70 countries pretty much, right? And so this is instead the case of India. Uh, similarly, starting in the 1990s, uh, going to 2012, and we see uh, that this differential in terms of distribution between rural and urban areas, uh, poor and non-poor, it's much less uh, stark. So, for example, for, uh, for China, what we see is that uh, huge development, huge changes, and the incentive to migrate kind of increased, even though the rural part of the population was decreasing, uh, and then slightly to decrease uh, later as the population in rural areas is shrinking and the actual base of poverty in China is, is shrinking. Um, in India, much lower incentive to migrate. We saw that it's, a, it's, it's less stark, the difference between rural and urban areas in terms of the distribution of the poor and non-poor. And, um, uh, but similarly, I mean, uh, this incentive to migrate goes up and then levels off and goes down, but still above what, what it was in 1994. And um, so despite very different development paths that China and India had, this incentive to migrate uh, evolved in a similar way, right? So and I think this is an interesting aspect of, of this measure that there are many ways uh, in which the interaction between rural and urban areas can then affect uh, the incentive to migrate. So, but going from the incentives to the actual flows, uh, you know, can estimate the propensity to migrate. So, uh, based on the fact that we have the data for uh, kind of rural and urban, poor and non-poor distribution, we can do that. The propensity to migrate essentially captures some cultural norms, bears to women migrating for educational purposes, the age profile of the population, since younger people uh, tend to have a higher propensity to, uh, to migrate. So this is a, a very uh, kind of preliminary empirical application using UN days of population data and DHS information on fertility. We basically uh, calculated the migrant shares uh, as a share of total population growth that is not due to natural population growth. So accounting for these differentials uh, in growth between rural and, and urban areas. So this is a kind of very preliminary results. I just showed the results at the, at the kind of continental level. You know, I mean, we, couldn't, we can go below this, but it's that they're so preliminary that I think that there wasn't much point in, in, in presenting a, a boatload of, of results. Uh, but essentially what we have is uh, for uh, Asian countries and Latin American countries, uh, we have significance in the, in the coefficients of this propensity to migrate, uh, different values being uh, in Latin American countries that it has a higher propensity uh, towards, towards migration. The uh, R squared in Latin America is quite high, actually, when one does a scatter plot, it's, it's quite, it is indeed quite, quite linear. Um, part of it is that, I mean, the propensity to migrate really only makes sense at the country level, right? I mean, it's, it is, so the issue is that you can't really estimate it at a country level. But for example, for the Asian countries, if you do just Southeast Asian countries, the R squared is, is higher. It's like 0 0.45. I mean, which considering that you're only regressing on one variable, uh, it's, um, uh, I was surprised. And uh, for Sub-Saharan Africa, I mean, we get a, what would be, I would say, a counterintuitive result. I mean, there are two 
possibilities here. One is, well, you're you know, doing it over a continent. It doesn't really make sense to talk about propensity to migrate. I mean, West Africa is very different from East Africa. It's very different from South Africa. So that's one aspect. Um, the other is that you, you could also be capturing the fact that being below the poverty line in Africa may also mean being much below the poverty line, meaning that you're on, in extreme poverty as opposed to in other, in other continents where being below the moderate poverty line, you're still close to that. So you might not have the resources to, to migrate. So you have a lower propensity. So um, clearly, as I said, I mean, the propensity to migrate should be estimated at the country level, or at least in homogeneous regions. So we're just starting off. Uh, the constraint here is that we have all the data on the poverty, but we're still working on, on kind of sorting out the, the, the migration rates by country. So we only have a small subset of countries for now. And, um, also, the paper in the paper, we extend the approach to also not just to poverty, but also access to education and health services. So there's a kind of formal derivation where it shows that you can you can do these as independent things in, in the estimation, uh, in independent independent variables, uh, with or without interaction terms, depending on the assumptions. Whether somebody migrates, uh, some somebody migrates for education, if that means that they're not migrating for um, for economic reasons, then you don't have any interaction terms. Otherwise, you have a bunch of interaction terms that you have to estimate, which is, can be problematic given the limited size of the data set. Mm -hmm. um, so in terms of the advantages, I think uh, I haven't gone into the details, but essentially the, the parameters do have a structural relationship to the drivers. I mean, you're trying to separate out the uh, uh, the incentive uh, linked to the economic uh, economic conditions or access to, to services, differential between rural and urban areas from the actual propensity, which is tied to age profiles and, and cultural norms. And um, it tries to capture this kind of push-pull in, in a bit of a more continuous uh, fashion. So it, it, it's in that tradition of the push-pull narrative, but it's... It, it, uh, I think it quantifies it in a way that is relatively simple. Uh, it can be mapped out for a large number of countries uh, just to see what the incentive to migrate would be. I mean, that number is very easy to calculate once you have the data. Um, as an extension, I mean, this can be extended beyond. Here I just segmented the uh, into poor and non-poor. One could use quintiles, for example, and see, you know, you, you can assume that the poorest of the poor don't have the resources to move, but the next up are looking at those in the fourth quintile, and, and you can still use this approach. Uh, it can be extended to thinking about migration mm -hmm. from urban areas to rural areas in developed countries. I mean, you could introduce amenities in, in this approach. In terms of caveats, and here I'm nearly concluding, um, we have that there are essentially three sources of potential errors in estimating this model. One is, well, models of misspecification. In this case, particularly omitted variables, since we just did, you know, very preliminary with what we had. But, uh, but even if we factor in um, access to health and access to education, there could still be uh, issues of misspecification. One aspect is also this having to define a threshold to distinguish between advantage and disadvantage in terms of access, be it to services, income, or, or education. So it may be that the threshold you choose is not reflective of the driver, right? In, in terms of what makes that migration decision that triggers it. Um, and I think one aspect which is, uh, I think, unresolvable is this notion, this entangling uh, the natural growth rates we can do, but this reclassification of rural areas into urban areas, which is happening at considerable speed in, in many developing countries, that's something that we can't really uh, address, at least for now. Um, we don't have that capacity, and apparently it is quite important. And that is ending up in our in migration estimate, migration number for a variable. Um, and finally, I mean, it's we assume the propensity to migrate as a fixed parameter to be estimated, but in fact, it may not be stationary, right? So, I mean, it can be affected by laws restricting rural urban migration. One can think of the uh, hukou system in, uh, uh, in China. Um, here, I mean, it's, it's quite straightforward to separate out the propensity to migrate from migration costs. So it's, it's something that I'm not too concerned about, but something that we haven't done yet. So to conclude, uh, this is very much work in progress, uh, driven by this need to do a global report 
on a relatively short uh, time frame, uh, where the focus is intended to be on rural migration, uh, different aspects. This would be only one small part uh, of the report. Um, we're interested in the feasibility of, of the approach presented here, uh, this notion of introducing a measure of incentives to migrate uh, and possible other sources of data to improve, to improve the estimation and suggestions on moving forward are clearly most welcome. Thank you.